All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for those of you at home for being a little bit patient while we got everything set up for this. I'd like to welcome to uh, this here, the RSN Spring Conferences presented by WPI, our guest and presenter, Mr. Andy Baker, who's going to be presenting about uh, manipulators and appendages in FRC. Andy, why don't you tell, your, tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, gosh. Um, first of all, I'm a I'm a husband and a father and an owner of a dog. My dog just, you can't see her, but she's right there. <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 I'm honored to be on this, this presentation tonight. Um, I think within first, I, I'm known for being, um, I've been a mentor since 1998. So I've been around, seen a lot of games. 1998 was the first, was the last year of no alliances. So that was a really weird introduction to first. Um, <laughs> In 2005, we uh, Mark Mark Coors and I actually summer of 2004, Mark Coors and I started Andy Mark. So I'm the president and owner of Andy Mark, and um, one of my I guess I I'm a Woody Flowers Award winner on the championship level. I won that in 2003. Um, that gives me a little bit of background. It gives you a little bit of background of me. All right. Well, thank you, Andy, for doing that. Um, so. A little bit of a background here before we get going. I want to say a big thank you to the people, some of the people who are helping to make this possible. Not only Andy for being here with us, but also to uh, WPI, WPI or Worcester Polytechnic Institute. They're a leader in project-based learning, and they were also the first uh, university to offer not only a bachelor's of science but a master's and a PhD program for robotics engineering. So, if you want to learn more about WPI, maybe uh, look into being a student there. Or if you are interested in supporting some of the projects that they're well known for, visit wpi.edu for more information. Okay, with that all said, last but not least, if you have questions for Andy during the presentation, go ahead and send them into the chat. We're collecting them starting now. With Just type exclamation point Q. We'll pick them out of the chat uh, and put them into, uh, and if we we'll look at them and if we like them, we'll ask Andy toward the end of the presentation. So with that all said, uh, Andy, why don't you uh, take us away and, and uh, show us what you've got here? Thanks, Francis. Um, all right, let's. So, this is going to be a presentation on mostly o overview designs for FRC robots that aren't drive bases. We're not talking about drive bases. That's a whole other slew of presentations, and we're going to get into it. As I said, I'm owner president of Andy Mark. I've been a mentor on two different FRC teams over the years, Team 45, Technocats, and then now Team 3940, Cybertooth. Um, by training, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I still do some engineering design work. Probably 10% of my time spent at Mark is doing design work or overviewing design. I actually miss some of that. Um, so, yeah, and we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about design aspects and overviews of um, mostly mechanical designs of FRC robots, um, different types of manipulators. So we're going to talk about collectors, like roller claws, latches, um, lifts, lift systems, arms, scissor lifts, telescoping lifts. We're going to talk about how to convey and gather game objects, how to handle those game objects or balls or whatever, shooting things, winches and turrets, all that stuff. And I've got, if you can see the bottom left-hand corner of the presentation slide, I don't know if it's, I'm not sure if it's covered up or not, but you can see a number, and that's a countdown from the number of slides that we have in this presentation. So it's on, right now we're on 27. That gives you an idea of how many more slides we're going to have. Yep. We're going to have 26 more slides. Cool. Just to give you an idea of what to expect. So let's get into it. Um, collectors. This year, big deal about collectors um, because you got to collect that that um, that ball, that yellow ball for for this year's game. Um, so a lot of teams have over the years iterated, and they've gotten really good at having horizontal rollers. It's a pretty high RPM speed for the roller, and what we what I try to do. What I've heard people try to do also is the, the tangential speed of the outside of the roller needs to be faster 
then the robot's driving speed in order for the ball to be sucked into the robot, pulled up over the bumper, or just into the robot. If it's, if it's slower, the ball is going to bounce away. So you want it to be faster than the robot's driving speed. These things are pretty wide. As you can see from the three examples here, um, they're on the top right, that's a famous robot from 2012. That's Team Hot's robot with this really massive, strong arm that picked up the orange balls that were much like this year's um, this year's balls. And it actually kind of looks like the Technocat robot down on the bottom left, oddly enough. The Technocat <laughs> robot on the bottom left is this year's Technocat robot, and it has um, – um, mechanic wheels or vectored intake wheels all on the front edge of that uh, intake roller system. <clears throat> and the, the idea there is to get the balls not only over the bumper, but to get the ball into the robot and the, at the right location. There, for Team 45 on the bottom left, the location they want their ball is right. Um, hard to describe it without, well, I, I got a mouse here. No, I can't do that. Anyway, it's, it's, it's about five inches in from the right of the pulley system or the roller system. So the, the mechanic wheels direct the ball into a certain consistent spot. So it goes into the robot at the same spot. Team Spectrum is on the bottom right. They just have some um, very, very simple but effective tubes that pull the ball over the bumper on that bottom right-hand picture. So... Horizontal rollers are the way to collect balls. That's what a collector is called. And then you got to figure out: Do you want to do? Do you want to have a, a mechanism going inside or outside um, of your robot in order to get the, the ball or the the component into your robot? So these are still horizontal roller type systems. The upper right, you can see that was from Stronghold, 2016. And that roller system is, is within the bumper system of the robot. Bottom, the bottom picture shows a, what I would call a, a Chief Delphi style collector system outside the robot. And that was made famous by Team 47, Chief Delphi, back in 2000. Wait, ho hold on. They named their team after the forum? <laughs> <laughs> Good, Francis. No, that was... Was the uh, the team that ran the forum back before they merged with another team and they became Team Fifty One. Ah. Anyway, the, the 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 two main the two main systems the two main ways to have a, a collector on the previous page they were all outside your robot. On this page, the top right one is inside your robot, and the main benefit there is your collector system is now protected. It's not hanging out outside your bumper. No one's going to ram it. Um, it might not be as effective because it's now narrower and you have this limitation of the robot rule is usually a six inch minimum segment on either side of that intake area. Um, so the inside area is, the inside roller is protected. It might be lighter weight. Uh, maybe, maybe because it's not outside your robot, it's not extra stuff coming outside your robot. And it's, it's harder to defend um, a defender can't come up and really stop you from intaking a robot or a ball or a robot, an object, because um, you, you tend to want to pull your collector system in if a defender is beating on you. So there's two different choices how to do a horizontal roller intake. <clears throat> a gripper. Let's talk about grippers. So a gripper in FRC is essentially something that handles or grabs a game object, not something on the field that's like a pipe. That would be more of a latch. So we talk about grippers and we talk about things that, that grab game objects. This is an old picture, 2004, Team 45. That was one of the robots that I helped design. And um, that was a roller claw. The bottom, the, 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 the top left of the picture shows a roller claw. That was a incredibly over-designed arm that was ridiculously too complex. There's a lot of game theory learning that happened with regard to how much complexity was in that arm that didn't need to be there. That's a whole other presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the gripper, essentially you're, you're grabbing a scoring object, not a field component. And a gripper usually grabs one item, like in... Um, 
uh, I can power up uh, the 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 power cubes. You're grabbing one of those items at a time. You're placing them on a scale. It's it's a pick and place. So touch it, grab it. You need to be fast when you're grabbing one item. You need to take less than a second just to grab the item. You're going to touch it. You're going to grab it. And your holding force of that item, be it a ball or a milk carton or a floppy or something or a disc, you need to, it needs to be at least twice the object weight. If you're, if you're gripping at the object weight or less, then it's going to slip out. But you, your force needs to be at least twice the object weight. And you need to have design in sensors that detect object presence, or your operators might not know when to stop closing their grip or stop rolling their claw in. So the designers, even the mechanical designers, need to design in those sensors to make sure the operator is, um, is easily, has an easy task to grab that object. You, you shouldn't always depend on the object or the operator being able to see when the object is being gripped. It needs to be lightweight, these grippers, because usually it's on an arm or a lift system, meaning it's up away from the drive base. The heavier it is, the more the higher CG or the farther out your center of gravity is going to be. Um, so whenever you move this thing around, you don't want it to make yourself tip over. So lightweight is a key thing. It needs to be able to bend, not break, because it, it hits things a lot. So you need to have some compliance with how it's designed. Um, one team that used for many, many years, um, actually uh, many teams use this, but one team that really always used PVC with their really elegant appendages and manipulators was Team 71 um, Hammond. They would always have something that would be out there made out of PVC that would grab a ball or something, and it would bend and wobble but not break. Very effective. Also, because it's far away from the drive base, it's outside the robot or up above the robot, it it might break even though it's compliant and you don't want it to break. It needs to be easily repairable. You need to have many spares of these grippers, make them easily repairable. We see teams coming into events now. They might have one drive base, maybe one lift system, but maybe two or three grippers because those are the things that tend to be beat up and break. Um, when you are grabbing a game piece, you need to have a high coefficient of friction with that game, game piece. You need to test out different materials. And that coefficient of friction needs to be at least one or preferably higher. I would say one and a half, 1.2, kind of like what you're trying to get with coefficient of friction between your wheels and the carpet. Very similar to that. So these are some different grippers over the years. Um, I don't know whose robot is that on the bottom right, but I thought that was pretty interesting. They were using a, a motorized it's like a snow a snow blower motor to grab the ten tooth gear from Steamworks with a kit chassis. I thought that was kind of cool. Oh yeah. Up upper right is a two thousand eight robot from Children of the Swamp one seventy nine has an overhand roller claw. Two fifty four, and one of their championship robots was from um, two thousand eleven. Upper left has a uh, a roller claw on both sides, top and bottom, grabbing the. A, a singular tube one at a time. And then the bottom left picture is a is a three jawed pneumatic gripper from Team Sixty in two thousand four. Uh, Bionic Bulldogs had a really good robot that year. Got beat in the quarterfinals on the division and was a surprise that their alliance got beat that early. They were one of the favorites to win. Yeah. Hey, uh, really quick, Andy, I've noticed that. Most of these more modern robots here use rollers to sort of bring in the ball to the to the gripper itself, whereas that older robot kind of didn't, right? Is is this kind of like where the technology is nowadays for first robots? I think so. I mean, roller claws, uh, for, for whatever reason, we, we thought of a roller claw on our 1998 robot on 45, and we were one of the first roller claws that I knew of. But I think roller claws, um, I think I get into the, some of the details of that. Oh, cool. Uh, it's it's harder. It's a slower grip than just collapsing on the ball with the, with a simple pneumatic grip, but it's it it gives yourself more compliance. So you don't have to you don't have to aim as well when you have a roller claw. No, I, I, maybe I didn't. Maybe I got rid of that part of it. But yeah, <laughs> I, I move on to latches on the next one. Sorry, but roller claw 
the key with the roller claw is if you can get that roller, if you can touch the object, be it a piece of cargo or a power cell or something, um, if you can touch that object and then roll your part of your gripper with the roller on it, roll it toward your gripper, then it becomes more apt to be being in your gripper. It takes a little time, but that actuation is very beneficial. Okay, let's keep going. Latches. Uh, looks like I, I covered up some of my words there, sorry. But <laughs> a latch is something that grabs a field component, not a game object. So you're latching onto a hanging bar or a bridge or a wall. Like this year, you'd have been hanging on to the the, the switch, the, the tilting switch um, that was inside that big generator area. I, no nomenclature, I, I need to... No, that, that was all right, yeah. yeah. Generator switch. But, and um, yeah, the, so the, the hanging onto the switch and then um, two years ago, hanging onto the really narrow um, uh, bar above the center scale on during, during the 2018 game. Be sure when you're thinking about latching on to a field component, be sure you read the rules and make sure it's legal or not. Sometimes first, since every year's game is different, all the field components are different every year. So they sometimes say that you can or cannot latch a hold to certain parts of the field. So don't just assume that you can just latch a hold of everything. One year, um, team one of the teams had a really, really effective latch, latch onto the an edge of um, the balancing bridge in 2012. It was it was Robonauts. They had a really nice latch. They were latching onto the bridge as other teams balanced with them. I thought it was really effective and cool. And there was some question about whether or not it was legal. And somebody during week one said that wasn't legal. That was not part of the game. So you got to watch when you latch. When you do that, if it's if it is legal, let's assume that it is for this application here. But you, you want to make sure it's secure. You want to make sure it's fail safe. Um, but then again, when you, at the end of the game, when you go onto the field to get your robot off the field, you want to quickly have the latch let go so you can get your robot off the field and not be that team that holds up everybody's cycle cycle times for every every match. <laughs> so uh, you might need a little switch or cut a zip tie or reverse a lock or something like that, but. You need to be able to let go after the match. Do not depend on power to do that. You won't be able to take your operator station out there and power up your robot to do that. I recommend using some sort of a smart mechanism. In my opinion, a smart mechanism would be something like on the right bottom picture. You can see that simple spring loaded system. I think, I think that's either 469 or 60 from the 2003 game, I think. But what it is, is the, the pipe goes into the middle section of that gripper. Sorry, latch. <laughs> it's a latch, not a grip. So the pipe goes into the middle, and the spring kind of acts as a cam as it lift, as it spins that, that secondary circular device over covering the, the, the pipe. So it's, it'd be spring-loaded out and then spring-loaded in. And when it's latched, you want to have a sensor so that you get a command to the, the operator once again that you say, hey, I'm latched, I have a sensor, my sensor is met, be it a limit switch or a photo eye or a hall effect sensor or something that says I have my latch completed. Um, again, use a manual lever to let the switch go after the Okay, let's talk about arms. Ooh. And I'm sure you do too, Francis. When you think about it, if there's any kind of a gold standard with arms over the years, of all of the years of first, I think maybe, maybe not recently because we haven't had an arm game for a few years, but Team, two, team 233 has been like the one of the standards. If you ever want to make it like a 233 arm, yeah. it's essentially a nice arm with a really, really strong shoulder. That would be maybe about two foot up from the base there. And, um, and then they have a, 
a, in this case, they have a telescoping arm where the inside of the arm is extended out from that pink um, outer portion that's really nicely CNC'd. And then there might be an elbow that has a hinge on it, or there might be a wrist. In this case, I would call that big upper joint probably a wrist. And that was holding, that's a 2008 robot holding a big, huge ball from 2008 with a double, looks like, looks like a double roller claw going on there. Yeah, this, the, 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 it's crazy to think how, uh, how big this robot actually is and how big that claw actually is. Like the 2008 ball compared to the 2014 ball or anything we've used in the last few years is, is literally larger than many robots that we build nowadays. So that, that robot is gargantuan. I think it was like 30 or 35 inches in diameter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Almost three foot. Yeah. So this thing, when it extended all the way up, I think it got about 10 foot tall. It was crazy big. Okay, let's keep going. So talking about arms, this is some basic math and physics with regard to arms. And the, the forces and torques required, or the torques required because of the forces on the arm. If you look at the two figures, they are carrying the same 10-pound weight, and they have the same length of their arm. But the, the, the torque required on the figure on the left is more than the torque required on the right because the D distance on the one on the left is, is, much, is much larger than the horizontal distance on the one on the right. So my point there is you're going to have different torques requiring different power wattages from your motors, even if, the, even if the arm is carrying the same weight. If it's all the way up, there's, there's really no torque needed to hold it up straight up. If it's all the way out, that's going to be your maximum work or maximum wattage and torque needed to hold that, in this case, 10-pound object. So if you have um, the same object 10 pounds on each arm, and you double the wattage from the arm on the left to the arm on the right, right? So the arm on the left is 125 watts, and you double the power to, to 250 watts on the right, you're going to get twice as much, much speed. That's how that works. That's pretty basic, but that's how, pretty much how, my, how that works. And when you design something to handle a, a game object or the weight of your arm, you have to figure both of those things in. And the weight of your gripper, you have to figure out the the, the center of that weight, how it's loaded over your whole arm. Um, whenever you design something you want to design for, as a rule of thumb, I try to design for about half of the stall torque of the electric motor, and I try to give myself a design of a safety factor of at least two times. I try to get about four times as a, as a safety factor for the amount of, um, of torque needed to move that arm up and down. because you don't know what all is going to be affecting that arm, not just that 10 pound weight, but your arm sometimes is being pushed down by an opponent or you're, you're running the arm into a wall or something. So it's not just the 10 pound weight of the game object or the game object and your arm and your gripper and all that stuff. So give yourself some safety factors, shoot for half of the um, stall torque as a starting point and add some safety factor to that. So when you design an arm, use lightweight materials. Once again, you don't want your center of gravity any higher than it has to be off your drive base. So, so use thin, thin tubes. Um, these days, usually most people are using 1 16th or even thinner aluminum. I would steer towards 6061 aluminum, not 6063. I've seen teams use um, thin wall steel. I don't recommend that. I've also seen teams use PVC and polycarbonate tubes. I think those are cool if you can get by with doing that. Um, I've seen people bend up polycarbonate sheet to make them boxes or triangles, and that gets really effective if you can do the bending and the riveting and such right. So lightweight materials to make your arms is a key thing. Again, designing your sensors for feedback and control. You want limit switches and potentiometers. You want you want to make sure that when that arm is at a certain position, when you turn off and on the robot, then the sensor remembers 
what that position is, like with a potentiometer, as opposed to an encoder. An encoder only detects the the movement of the arm. It doesn't possess, doesn't detect the position of the arm. There's a difference. So try to use a potentiometer for arm position because of the on and off thing. And then try to design in end of travel limit switches so that if your potentiometer goes haywire, your limit switches will stop you from making things crash and break. So it's kind of a error proofing way of designing feedback into your arm. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to say on that, you know, we've, we've had elevator games for quite a while now, but, um, since aren't for many people maybe haven't built arms in a long time or maybe never have, but arms because of the amount of torque you put on them can very easily just break themselves completely in two if you decide to hit a hard stop and just keep going. Whereas your elevator is more likely to just break a motor, so you absolutely have to do what Andy just said. Otherwise, you're you're in for a bad time. <laughs> and it's hard to repair those things. Oh yeah, I think there's always a, a weakest link in the whole system. I remember 2004, we were in. We were at Great Lakes Regional. We had a really good robot. It was it was this one way back here. Let me get back to it. It was this one right there. So this robot was our 2004 robot. And the weakest link we found out was on the upper right hinge of that of that arm was a a worm gear. And whenever that arm over torqued itself or got banged on or whatever. A tooth on that worm gear was the thing that broke, and so Ugh. something's going to break on on your arm. It just if if you can if you can get your sensors to detect it before it breaks, that's really cool, and it saves a lot of mechanical breaks. Um, okay, linkages help control long arms. Like a four bar linkage will keep you from over traveling pretty easily, and it helps your position. I'll get to that. I'll, I'll go more into linkages here in a little bit. I've learned, like, from my 2004 experience and 2005, both of those years. Yeah, keep it simple. Try to try to keep your arm as simple as it can be to do the work. Um, I think the team I usually refer to as the prime example for this was the 2005 robot from Beachbox, Team 330. They had a single jointed arm. They picked up a Tetra. It was a PVC. Um, fabricated game piece. They would stack these things on top of PVC goals. And they had one actuator on their arm. That was it. They didn't have a gripper. They just had a hook and a shoulder. So super simple, and they won the world championships with two of the robots. But it was super easy to operate. It was really simple to repair. Less parts to have and spare parts, more robust. Keep it simple, stupid is, is a, a good rule of, of thumb for especially arms. Use COTS items or off-the-shelf items now more and more. You know, there's a lot. There's all these wonderful companies out there. I I run one of them, but there's all kinds of wonderful companies that make really cool off-the-shelf things that help you make your arm work well. Also, I'm going to talk more about this with um, arms. Try to use a counterbalance to help balance the weight of an arm. So I'm going to talk about the anatomy of arm, <clears throat> and there's some different things on this picture. You can see my wonderful drop center wheel drive base down there with um, these, these nice block CAD I have. <laughs> that's but, that's a lot of drop, but it looks like it's going to work. Yeah, it's. I know it's. I'm really proud of this design here. <laughs> um, but you can. Okay, so so the red dot is a motor gearbox um, combination, um, and the the two red dots on my on my uh, structure for the arm are two different different places, not the same. You wouldn't use both of these on your arm, but you would, you would use one or the other. I would prefer to use the bottom one because that lowers your center of gravity. So you would have a motor and then also position and motor control sensors. That's the yellow dot. So you'd have some posi positioning sensors like a potentiometer um, and maybe some, oh, some sensors that help you uh, control PID control with your arm movement. And then the green dot shows a game object sensor. In this case, we're grabbing a, a blue cube up there or, or a blue blue square. And when the blue square is there, the green, the green sensor says, hey, I got this blue square. Other parts of this arm in the back, you can see this kind of pinkish 
bar that that's the counterbalance or the counterweight or spring. A lot of teams just use latex tubes and it works pretty well. Latex tubing wrapped around multiple times. It's kind of janky, but it works. Uh, some te other teams use like an air gas spring. Um, some teams use constant force springs or extension springs. I don't like constant force springs because I got cut once on them. I don't. And I, a friend of mine got cut on them. They're kind of dangerous, mm. but they're legal. Yep. A lot of teams use them. There's um, a great company out of um, Philadelphia area, Vulcan Springs, donates a lot of springs to the kid of parts. But they, you got to use them right, and they will work well. But just be careful. They, they can cut your skin. Just be careful with that. Latex tubes are probably more prevalent and more popular, but both um, constant force springs and latex tubes work pretty well as counterweights. On the structure of the arm, try to use some kind of a thin wall aluminum or plastic. And then um, on the top of the arm, you can see that four bar linkage. I'm going to get more into that with another slide. Uh, be careful when you're using an arm to make sure you're not um, extending past what first calls the, the frame perimeter too far. Every year that seems to change. Some years, I think this past year was 12 inches. We, we couldn't go 12 inches past our frame perimeter. Um, I when you have, got it, like for real, for real. Yes. When the arm swings, it might go past the frame perimeter. So you got to watch oh. out. Hey, hey, Andy, we're going to take a very quick break here, really quick. Frank, got to leave. All right. What? Well, yeah, one sec. Hold on. We're gonna. I'm gonna rebuild this here. Uh. Okay. All right. One second. Yeah, that guy. That. This is why I want to do it in the other channel because Frank joined up and blew the whole thing up. So hold on. All right. We're good to go. The motor in the bottom location where this the bottom red dot is you can have a push rod that pushes your arm up and down or pushes it up and lets it fall down in a controlled manner i like that way it's it keeps your center of gravity a lot lower one of the teams that does that really well over the many years is team 67. i think their 2005 robot was one of the first robots that did that really well that they won they won the world championship with 330 and with 503. Okay, four bar linkages. Um, there's a picture there of a double four bar linkage uh, with power up. That was a really that was a popular design with a few teams. Team 33 did that really well, and also um, 5010 out of Indiana did that really well. So probably there there are a few teams that did this double four bar linkage. But the, the the really big benefit of a four bar linkage with your arm is it <clears throat> it maintains orientation of the thing that's in your gripper. You don't have to really worry about um, moving your gripper up and down. When the four bar linkage is done right, your, the orientation of your gripper assembly is maintained constantly. Um, also, it, <clears throat> it does limit how much the arm can go up and down because those, those, four bar, those two bars that are um, moving, they do hit each other. <clears throat> Beware of your hinge points and your pin loadings that can be pretty high. Um, the lower piece should be a heavier, um, thicker, uh, more structural material than the higher, the upper piece. Upper piece can be a thinner wall tube. Counterbalance this if you can with either a shock on the front or a latex tube or a constant spring in the back. And watch your CG or your center of gravity if you, as you move forward or backward. As I said, it does have limited rotation. But it, the really big benefit here, the really reason why you want to do it, your gripper in a known location. You usually don't have to motorize your gripper. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about telescoping lifts. I'm going to get into some details here. There's a lot of different types of extension lifts, scissor lifts, those kinds of things. So this is actually, I just took this picture today off the robot that I'm a mentor on, 3940. So this is one of the extension lift um, mechanisms. And this uses, in this case, we use chain and loops of chain in a cascading effect. But in general, 
my tips with the extension lift system is you want to drive your cables or whenever I say cables here, you might, it might need chain or whatever, belt, cables, chain. Uh, I'm going to refer to those as cables. But you want to drive it up and down. Do not depend on gravity to work constantly all the time because you're binding, your, your system might be binding. So you want to push it up and pull it down. Um, your segments need to move freely. They need to have pretty good bearing systems. And your cable links need to have some adjustability. Um, like in this case with, with chains, we have a turnbuckle on there. With cables, you need to have a, 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 a take-up system or a nice big heavy spring or something that make it adjustable because chain stretches, cables stretch, your system isn't super secure and robust, so you need to have some cable lengths be adjustable. You don't want it to be sloppy. You don't want your chains and, or your cables just flopping around. Your bearings need to be fairly tight. When you have segments, multiple segments, you need to have, in my, in my opinion, you need to have about 20% minimum for overlap of lengths. I did see, I should refer, I should have a picture of this, but I did, I did see an FTC robot this year that was stacking sky stones. And their segments were like this long, maybe seven inches long, six inches long. And their, their overlaps were only about a half inch or an inch. And they, wow. they stacked sky stones, sky stones, about five foot tall. It was crazy tall. I'll, I just thought of that. I should oh. put that in my presentation. Anyway, <laughs> you need to have stiff, um, strong segments. It can be thin wall aluminum. Like all this stuff on this purple robot here is all 6061, 1 16th inch thick um, two by one tubes. It is kind of heavy. There, is, there are some overlapping hardware. So it's somewhat of a heavy system. So, so you need to make sure you minimize your weight and just optimize your weight to be as low as it can, especially at the top. Your last stage can be a lot weaker and less rigid than your first stage because your first weight stage is carrying the whole thing. Just like if you've ever been in a, in a, like a cheerleader pyramid, if you're on the bottom, you get everybody on top on your shoulders. The person on top just needs to have good balance. So... <laughs> Your first stage could be a thicker piece of metal and more structurally sound. Your your last stage can be a little bit weaker. So the different types of rigging when you do your stages lifts. So the one on the left is a continuous stage. One on the right is a cascading stage. Um, I mentioned cascading earlier, and cascading really essentially means each session, each, each section of the lift. Has its own has its own cable or belt or chain. The one on the, the left, the continuous stage, it's one continuous snake woven through the entire length of all the stages. For me, I was actually talking to Ruth about this today, and she asked me what which one I liked, and I've always done the cascading stage. I I don't know if I've ever done one with continuous. Really. I, it's a preference of mine. If you look back on, on this purple robot here, each one of those stages is is um, cascading because it's like that's that's one stage that you can see the the loop of chain. There's a different loop of chain on that's inside one of the tubes, so they're totally separate, and that's what a cascading stage is. Okay, more details here. Let's talk about continuous. So the cable goes up and up and down. Um, the same speed. Um, the, I think the intermediate sections jam more so with con continuous rigging, and there's low consistent tension spread throughout the entire length. There's not a there's not a higher higher tension stage and a lower tension stage. It is pretty complex because you got to route the whole thing with one cable or one chain, and I think. I might not know this exactly, but I think the final stage moves up and down first. Moves up first and down last. Notice on this picture, there's the the yellow the yellow um, graphic shows the how the thing is being pulled down. the The red cable is when it's pulling itself up. So you can internally rig continuous stage um, con continuous um, 
cabling and <clears throat> it's more complex but it's cleaner so it's harder to maintain but if you get all your cables inside your tubes and such it's it's clean but it's it might be complex to to um, repair it now cascading when you rig something like this um, upward and downward cables have move at different speeds because um, <clears throat> why is that in this case drawn on the right you can have uh, the yellow the yellow cable is running at a different ratio than the the red cables are and because of that you have higher higher force loads on the on the red cables there's more tension on the lower stage cables because there's more weight loaded on them and it's not distributed out amongst the entire system yeah so you need you need lower gearing to deal with higher forces on that lower section of the cables yeah okay so there's a lot of cots version if you do a lift system um I, I still see a lot of cu really good custom lift systems but if you're not comfortable as a team putting in the design work and the resources to make your own or to make your own list system then please go shopping and find a list system that you can buy obviously we have one at andy mark i think i think rev has one i think west coast has one there's there's some really good systems out there so just yeah. shop around they might not be as effective as or perfect as some of the ones you see out there with the top top tier teams but those guys have worked out ways and how to build those systems on their own so until you're there i'd recommend just buying a system and installing it on your robot yeah and actually on uh on monday we had a presentation by uh by ben martin from team 225 where yeah. he he discussed a whole bunch of off-the-shelf solutions including all the different kinds of elevators so if you want more info on that you can uh you can check that out over on our YouTube channel. Cool. Yeah, I I should have referenced that. Ruth Ruth was probably me. Hey, you reference Ben's presentation for Monday. So <laughs> I thank you, Francis. Oh no problem. So scissor lifts. Um, oh, I'm gonna boy. be blunt here with the scissor lift. I don't recommend it, but I'm gonna tell you why. I can't just say don't do this. I'm gonna tell you why because there's teams that do this still pretty well. The picture that you see here is an FTC robot at World Championships. So it is it is not trivial to get an FTC team to World Championships. So obviously they're doing something right. But I'm going to tell you some things about scissor lifts and what I, what I like about them and what I don't like about them. And there's more disadvantages. So the good thing about a scissor lift, the main good thing is you can you can really get really short. You can really get squat and short and go under fuel barriers at a retracted height when you use a scissor lift. Um, I remember te teams in year 2000, we had a we had a bar we had to go underneath. And that was a popular way to, to lift up after they went under, underneath the bar. But the disadvantages are numerous, and it's it's heavy. And if you get all this mass up high and it starts wobbling, there's a lot of mass that's there's a lot of weight in that scissor lift system that gets pretty high, and it messes up your center of gravity. Even though your center of gravity is directly still over your robot, you're not outside your frame perimeter, you're still top heavy. And if you get bumped or hit, I've seen a lot of scissor lifts robots fall over. It yeah. doesn't deal well with side loads. So if, if I were to push on this robot here from the side that we're looking at, then it, it will start to tip over and it'll flex that way. And it doesn't want to do that. When it starts doing that, it's going to bind itself up and it's hard to. Um, move up and down. <clears throat> the bottom section is section especially has to be built very precisely. This isn't something that you can easily do with a, with a drill press and a hacksaw and a, a hand drill. It needs to be CNC machined to get really precise things because of the binding issue I talked about. As you get higher with your scissor lift, your, your stability gets a lot lower. You decrease your stability. So whatever you're doing up there with a gripper or you're holding an object, it gets pretty precarious the higher you get. And your loading of that lower section, you have to 
you have to really put a lot of force into doing whatever that lower section is doing in order to, to, to start the movement at the beginning of your travel. And in my opinion, that's the number one reason why you don't do a scissor lift. There's so much force needing, needed to get, get this thing started, it breaks a lot of things on your robot. Granted, we see scissor lifts in our community. We see those man lifts at convention centers or guys that are working on roofs or ceilings or whatever. And it's a good design for a big, heavy machine that you can stand on as a person. But if you have the weight limits that we have in FRC or now FTC, I don't recommend this. You know, on, on Team 190, we have a joke that uh, every team builds a scissor lift exactly once. And uh, and then they're they're done with them forever. And that we were Team One Ninety was lucky that we built ours in back in nineteen ninety two, and then decided not to do it ever again. I, I gave this presentation to the the area teams here in Indiana um, back in the fall. Actually, just like four or five teams. It was it was Iron Kings, Technocats, uh, Panther Tech, and Cybertooth. And I gave this presentation to these these kids on these teams. Even the, these are experienced teams, but every experienced team has has kids come on the team that are new kids. And they want to do well, and they they want to build a really good robot. And I tell them, you should not build a scissor lift. Don't make this mistake. But they, say, why not? <laughs> I think it's, so even even if even if they're like a team one ninety or team forty five, and they've been doing this every single year, person, the new kids on the team, oh yeah, still still need to be told really seriously, you shouldn't do this. Yes, you trust us. <laughs> you listen to Francis. Please listen to me. Don't do this. Yes. So let's compare, let's compare the, what we talked about with making something go vertical. Scissor lift is off the table. You're not doing a scissor lift. Let's talk about arms versus lifts because there's some advantages to each one of these. Are you going to reach over an object? Um, an arm is better because you can, an arm, you can move outside your frame perimeter, reach over. If you're going to fall over and try to get back up, you really can't do that with a lift, but you can do that with an arm if it's strong enough. Can you go underneath things or underneath the barriers? If your arm folds down, yes. If your lift gets down, maybe this year there's there are some lifts that were on hinges and that can go underneath things. Like this year, I actually saw a lot of telescoping lifts on hinges that would, would, that would do this to go underneath the, um, oh gosh, the thing with the control panel. Yeah, the, con the control, the, the trench run. The trench run, the trench run. Yeah, that's what we did. So the, the arm, um, the center of gravity issue with the arm is not centralized. So as you move that arm around, you're jeopardizing your center of gravity, and that's that's not a good thing. But with a lift system, your center of gravity is usually over your, your base. It's not outside your frame perimeter, so it's a centralized mass. An arm has to have room to swing in order to raise itself up. So if you're up against a wall, there's a wall here, and you, you need to move your arm, and you're hitting the wall. That's not good. But the lift system can go straight up parallel to that wall. With an arm, um, how high can you go? The more articulations, the more height. It's difficult, mainly because of the CG issue. But, but with, a, with a lift system, with the elevator lift system, you can go higher, easier. I would think that, um, well, now with COTS off-the-shelf parts, the lift system is not as high, so I should have, that should that should both say moderate if you use cots for a lift system. A powerful lift, I think you can you can have something heavier on your lift system versus heavier something on your arm, mainly because of the CG issue of your arm not being able to um, uh, you don't have a centralized center of gravity. Um, a lot of teams recent years, if uh, like. Um, during uh, Deep Space 2019, a lot of teams were using an, a, a lift system with an arm that would place the uh, the hatch panel or place the cargo. So lift system got them close, and then the arm did the final work. So a combination of these two things might be a really nice solution for your application. Okay, so conveying and gathering. I, I took another picture of our robot this morning, kind of a top view of the robot, hopefully it doesn't mess people up there. But we're talking about conveying things inside your robot, um, rollers, those kinds of things. So I'm sure 
almost every team learned this issue, learned this lesson this year. Balls jam in robots. So they get sticky and they rub against each other. And once two balls, especially like those foam balls we had this year, or imagine last year's um, cargo, the orange balls, if we'd had two of those, and they stuck together, they do not want to roll, they do not want to get out of your robot. So the what I tried to point out here was on the right, there's different different graphics that show what the problem is and what the solution is. The top graphic shows two balls rotating in the same direction and the interface between those two balls when they hit each other, the ball, the tangentially, um, the tangential movement of the ball is in opposite direction. So they, they tend to stick together, they don't want to move anywhere. So one solution would be to use individual rollers, like what I show on the second middle picture, but um, you can, and you can drive individual rollers independently, and you can drive one ball out and then one ball after it, <clears throat> not like the top view where you only have one, one conveyor with one motor. Again, the middle section, the middle view isn't a very good so solution. I would recommend the bottom view where you have a, a conveyor on each side of the ball and you have linear motion of the ball where they're not rolling. So you can spit the ball out of your shooter or whatever you're doing by not rolling the ball through your system. Sometimes you can use a slippery material like PTFE or Teflon and it might help you with the top two examples, but I wouldn't depend on that. So more control of your game objects or balls, the better you are off you're gonna be. Do not depend on gravity, things will jam. And try to reduce random movements. Also, don't be that, taint, that team that shows up to an event that says, hey, this inflated ball is too big or it's too small. You guys, you FTAs aren't adhering to the rules and the ball's not exactly right like what it said in the rule book. If your robot and your design can handle variance of ball sizes, then you're ahead of those teams that are whining about that at the events. Don't be that team that whines about ball size. Be able to handle different variants of ball size. Have a flexible system. <clears throat> Speed versus volume, optimize for the game. It really kind of depends if you're, if you're, if it's Steamworks and if shooting a fuel into a steam generator was a valuable thing, like it was like on Einstein, then you want a lot of volume. But if, if you grab or grabbing one piece of cargo and placing it on the top of a rocket ship, you want to be pretty fast and speedy. So it kind of just depends on what the game requires. So there's a lot of ball shooting systems. Obviously this year we had a pretty good game for ball shooting if we were able to play it more. Um, <laughs> So I have a picture of 118's robot from this year. I actually got to see that team. I got to see that that team play oh. in Plano, Texas, at the district event, and they actually it was the only time ever that a team was able to get the ranking point from the control panel. Pretty awesome. Yeah. So when you have a ball shooting system, you want to have a, a secure shooting structure. You want it to be rigid. You don't want it flopping around. If the ball goes through that system and you're your rigidity is not there, you're not going to be able to control the accuracy of your shot. So you have to have a rigid system. You want to feed your balls individually and you want to control your flow. Um, you might want to have a turret, you might not. It kind of depends. I'll talk about turrets here in, in a more a little bit. Um, sensors, you want to detect your ball presence when it's going through your system. And you, you can have a single wheel shooter, a double wheel shooter, a catapult. I've been on a team that has done catapults twice. Once it was very successful. Once it was very not successful. <laughs> so catapults give you better accuracy. Depend like in 2012 we had a catapult, and it did not. The catapults don't care about the size or the density of the ball. It just shoots this thing, and it's it's. Um, whereas wheel shooters depend on ball pressure and density, and when in 2012 at the regional we were at, when they switched, when the FTA switched all of the balls out from the um, qualification rounds that were old balls to new balls in the finals, all the teams with the really nice wheeled shooters couldn't hit a shot. Oh, no. 
But our catapult was really good, so we won. Hey, there you go. Um, so, <clears throat> so anyway, um, gosh, I, I've got one slide here on ball shooting systems. Really, that could be a whole hour, another presentation on ball shooting systems from what teams learned this year. Maybe that's another idea for another, another presentation by me or somebody else. Another thing that's not a drive train or is an appendage or a manipulator, what I would call a winch or a lift. Um, actually, I talked about lifts and arms, but let's, let's focus on this being called a, a winch. I shouldn't have the word lift on it. And you can see I have two pictures here, one from um, 2020, a 148th robot, and one from um, 2017. That's Miss Car 1574 out of Israel. And winches are pretty good systems for climbing into up a, onto a, a horizontal pole like we are this year, or it's a good system for climbing a rope, we learned in 2017. So it, you, can, you can raise your robot with that winch and lock it up. In the middle of 1574's picture there, you can see this big spool that's right underneath that white light, and that's where they're their, their spool was controlling the, the, the cable or the rope in this, in this case, and it was just spinning at a pretty high torque, and it would pull the robot up as it, as it spun. And then whenever you do a, a lift or a winch system like that, you need to design in some kind of a locking system to, pre to prevent back drive, because your robot is up in the air, it has all this mass wanting to pull the thing down, so I need to have like a um, a ratcheting system or something that locks it so it doesn't fall down. A lot of teams use like the um, ratcheting wrenches. They sometimes break, but like a half inch ratcheting wrench is a yeah. very popular thing to prevent that back drive. Yeah, uh, we, 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 oh, go we, ahead. yeah, we my team used that this year as well, and and I know a lot of teams did in 2017 for climbing the rope because for for holding just your robot weight, if you don't expect any shock loads on it as you're doing it. Which you know, perhaps maybe that's a bad assumption sometimes, but it it, it works surprisingly well and is a lot easier than it's kind of like the cot solution to a ratchet, right? You don't have to you don't you don't have to to design or cut or build your own. And, and, it, and we're all using hex shafts anyway, so a hex ratchet wrench is a wonderful thing for this type of thing. But at the same time, Francis, have have you broke those on your robots doing doing them? I've I've actually I haven't broken any yet. Uh, but okay. on 2017, we made it was so incredibly difficult to actually get the uh, the robot off of the off of the rope by the end of the season that we we were we 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 didn't know if we'd ever use it again because it's really hard to disengage that Paul. So this year we actually Ken Stafford made some crazy stuff where he basically took the wrench and had it like pop out into this little guide so you could like move it like a shift lever to disengage it from yeah. the whole system. But yeah. I think if you design in that actuation, like like what you said, Kim and his team did, with uh, you guys on your team, if you design, if you know that ahead of time, know it's going to be hard to throw that little lever or some way to reverse that latch. That's what you got to do. Yeah, exactly. The reason why I put one forty eight up there, I think they had a really well concealed pulley system that was winching their their telescoping system up or collapsing it as they hung on this year's uh on this year's switch and i got to be i got to be an announcer for a few matches down in plano when i saw them and 118 play and at the time and i said it aloud at the time but at week two this year 148 in my opinion from what i heard and saw was the best robot in the world. Now, people would disagree with me on that. There's some other robots that were very, very good. But from what I saw that day consistently perform was 148's really good robot this year. So they were really looking forward to world champs doing well and too bad that we didn't have it. For many, many teams, but these guys really had a really good robot this year. Yeah, I so agree. I, I, love, I love just watching the robot swerve and shoot. It was so much fun watching the video. I think my last slide here, this is, I got one slide to go. So my last turret. So um, 
I, I, one of the questions when you when you build a robot and you have a place to score is, do you do a turret or not? I think one of the, I think deep deep space. There was a lot of teams that really had really good designs, and if they did a turret, they were able to utilize it really really well. I was trying to think back, like on like Striker had a really good turret. Um, well, two fifty four had a really good turret. There's a lot. There's a lot of teams had really nice turrets <clears throat> that were. They, they would pull up next to the goal and they would do the fine tuning positioning for their goal scoring mechanism that that was only done with a turret. Once you got your drive place, drive base close to the goal, you would let your turret do the rest of the work. Now, when you do a turret, it has to be very robust. These things, if you were to break your turret, you are you are in a lot of trouble because usually they're buried underneath a shooter or an arm or something. They're part of the structure of your robot. So you do not want to ever break those. They're difficult to repair. So, but also they can be pretty slow moving. You don't, you're not making a turret do 360. I would, the maximum use of your turret really needs to be about 90 degrees. So it can be pretty slow moving, not very fast. <clears throat> Maybe do a 180 degree um, movement with your turret, but that would be the maximum. I would shoot for 90 at the most. You can use all kinds of things to actuate your turret, like a belt or chain or gears or whatever. I think I've done gears and chain. Um, it's not very quick, so doing one game object at, the, at a time where you have to be quick, I talked about that earlier. I might not recommend that, but we saw teams during deep space prove me wrong with that issue. Um, this is good for stream shooting, like uh, this year's shooting five five um, yellow balls into the goal, getting yourself close, and then aiming with the turret, shooting all those balls. That would be a good application for a turret. It's good for placing something over a blocked defensive robot or a blocking defensive robot. So aiming a ball placement like in 2004, we used a turret, and it was really effective. For our team in 2004, I think Armorbot, um, Andrew at Armorbot has a cot solution that I'm kind of envious of. So it's a nice turret. So if you want an off the shelf solution, they're out there. Like, um, and like, like Francis said with regard to um, the presentation from Monday. So look for your cot solution. There's a, we used to have one in Antimark. We decided not to have it anymore. But like I said, Armor, Armorbot has one. So, Whew. that's my presentation. So uh, I guess Francis or anybody else, if you guys have questions, I can answer some. Yeah. Works. Yeah. If you've got any questions for Andy, uh, just type them into the Twitch chat with the command exclamation point Q and then your question. And uh, when you do that, we will uh, take them, take a look at them and put them up on screen for us to answer here. So we've got our first question here ready to go. This one's coming in from... Uh, a user named uh, Amido62, and they're asking, what kind of ratchet systems do you recommend other than uh, a half-inch ratcheting wrench? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've seen some custom... Uh, I, I volunteer as an inspector. I, mean, I really like inspecting robots. I really try to be a, an advocate for the teams as they go through inspection, and I've seen some really good... Um, Homemade ratchet systems that are made by the teams. Uh, you can you can get like a like a boat lift ratchet system or a, like a tennis court cord tensioning system, but those all thing those things are way too heavy. So there's, I guess correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't know of a really small ratchet system that I would pursue that's really better than a half-inch ratchet from Lowe's or Home Depot. Sorry. No, that's fair. I think, I, I, I think, I now, I don't use Versus Planetaries all that often. I think there's a ratchet stage for Versus Planetaries, but... Versus, yeah, Versus Planetaries have a ratcheting system on them. I just, I just haven't used one. Right. And I don't have much with those. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm good, because Versus Planetaries are good stuff. I just haven't used it. Right. That makes sense. All right, so we've got another question here. This is from uh, rsisk101. Uh, they're asking, uh, for manipulators that are outside of the frame perimeter, do you recommend they be stiff or flexible 
in order to handle impact from uh, other robots or game objects? For, for what systems outside the frame perimeter? For, for any sort of manipulator that lives outside of your frame. Maybe like your, oh, okay. your roller claw or something. I think it needs to be as compliant as you can. It, it, needs, to, it needs to bend and not break. So if you have something that's... If you have aluminum out there, that's fine. It just If you bend or, or severely bend aluminum past its yield point, it's not going to go back. Whereas polycarbonate or PVC has a lot more forgiveness of bending toward their yield point, so it's going to spring back into position. So if you can do, sometimes it makes it wobble, but if you can handle the flexibility of a PVC or piece or polycarbonate, I would recommend that. If you need the rigidity of something out there, just for positioning sake and such, then I would still rec- I would recommend lightweight aluminum. Just make sure you have a lot of spares. And um, it's good to, good to hear from you, Rick, sis. So I, I, I was able to see you just a little bit out in L.A. this year, but... Um, it's good to see you, Rick. Hey, there you go. It sounds like you've been uh, you've been doing a lot of traveling lately. That's great. <laughs> well, not I lately, but have, like you know, this year, this season. Events, during weeks one and two, I went to LA North, and I went to um, Utah Regional Week Two, and then I went to Plano District Event Week Two. Wow! I did two events in one weekend. That was kind of fun. Nice. And then they, and then we got shut down. But yeah, I, I, I had some good travel weeks one and two. Cool. All right. This this question comes from uh, Nutty Man fifty four, uh, and they're asking from manipulators that are out. Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, that's not their question. They're asking about uh, what process do you use uh, to de- uh, okay? What process do you use to decide which mechanism type to use for a given game challenge? How do you pick between a claw or an elevator or a or or I should say an elevator or an arm or a claw? or a gripper or a roller or what have you? I think the best way to do that would be a time study. You gotta, you gotta estimate the amount of time it takes to do a task with each one of those items. Um, well, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add to that. So, hmm. time study. How fast does it take to do that actuation with an arm versus a lift, a roller claw versus a pneumatic system? Also, what are your resources on your team? That's probably more important. Yeah. Um, Nick Lawrence does a pretty good presentation with regard to resource tokens. And if if you think it's better to have a, a telescoping lift versus an arm, but you know how to do an arm, and you're totally uncertain about a t- telescoping lift, and your your best designers all graduated last year as seniors, and you have a bunch of freshmen and sophomores that need a lot of help, you might want to depend on just doing your arm that you know how to do. Yeah, that's true. So resources might be a big deal. Um, well, you know, think- as you say that, that, that's kind of the reason that Pink, you know, has done, did what they did for so many years, right? That they like that. And also... This is maybe going even further back, but Team 173 Rage from Connecticut, they were very, very, very familiar with, you know, we used to joke that they made the same arm and just put on different robots every year, but... But it worked. Yeah. Mike Donetti is a very good mentor, very good designer, and he knew how to lead and make a really nice arm. Yeah. Early early in the year, it, it might not work out of the gate, week one, but by the end of the year, that thing was humming and it yeah. was working really well. So <laughs> they had a pretty good system down at 233. Yeah. All right. So uh, we got another question here. This is uh, from user. Oh, this is going to be a tricky one. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce it, but this user asks, um, do you have any f- favorite or atypical or uh, excuse me, any favorite atypical or creative mechanisms from recent years that you've seen? Um, I didn't get to see him in person yet, but I saw, I saw Argos's lift system this year, Argos out of Illinois, what, 17, uh, 1756, right? 1736, who's Argos? Team Uh, Argos. That sounds about right. 1756, yes. 
they turned their list system into a rack and pinion. Oh, so yeah, yeah, took, yeah. They took two by one tube. They, did, they drilled holes in it on the CNC. That they, were, they were accurately placed on their two by one tube. And they just ran a, a sprocket just to drive that darn tube up and down. Like, that's the most elegant, efficient list system I've seen in a long time. <laughs> that's pretty darn elegant. Yes. Um, pretty, pretty cool. And I, I didn't get to see it in person. Um, another thing I saw, I was out in LA North this year and I saw, oh gosh, Andrew from Armorbot. I met him for the first time in a long time. I, I saw him many years ago, but their, their, their mechanism, they had, well, okay. So, so this year on these robots, there's a lot of these robots that had these revolver style ball, um, singulators. So the. The ball would come in. It would go into this this five slotted revolving uh, singulator of some sort, and a lot of a few teams did this really well, and it was hard to do. But for whatever reason, is it is it fifty eight eighty one, fifty eight eighty three? Darn it, I should know these numbers better. But that was the LA North, and they had theirs on the side. So they they spun their revolver on its side, and the ball came up into their turret. Oh wow! The, the top. It was actually not even on the side. It was like cocked about 10 degrees. It was so odd. <laughs> like a front-loading washing machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> Their wow. inspector. I was like, that is so cool. That's so unique. Cool. So, but I, I see so many examples of that kind of stuff. I can think back also, also a very vivid memory was, um, I forget the team number in Israel, but, but Ruben. Everybody knows Ruben out of Israel. He's a CSA and he's a um, inspector and a volunteer extraordinaire. Um, Ruben Stahl and his team um, for uh, the 2012 game, they used a tennis racket. They used a tennis racket to knock the ball up into the goal. Just a simple <laughs> tennis. Wow. Okay. I would have never have thought to use that. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Um, pretty cool. They had mechanicals on the robot. I'll never forget this. Sorry for this. No, no, but they had that's good. The robot. But I was totally, my mind was blown because they had mechanicals on the robot that they bought from us, Andy Mark, and they had a poster on their wall written in Hebrew that I couldn't even read that described how these mechanicals worked. I'm, I'm halfway across the world. People are describing in a different language. I can't even read and understand how my products are working. Yeah. That was it's pretty awesome. Yeah. My experience. Right. It's good to it's it's, to, it's like one of those times when you kind of see what what the reach of what you do is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very humbling. Um. So we got a, a few more questions coming in. Again, if you want to ask a question of Andy uh, about the stuff we're talking about, just type exclamation point Q in chat, and uh, we'll pick it up and put it on screen for you guys. So this one comes in from Nutty Man Fifty Four again. They're asking any tips or recommended resources for someone designing a new mechanism that they don't have prior experience with? Okay. Um, beyond beyond that, the presentation you just gave, is, I suppose. Is, that, is Nutty Man Sean? Is that right? No, that's Nutty Man 54. I, I, I don't, I don't want to out them, but uh, I can tell you who it is afterward. I know who that is. I know that. I know that's, it's the same on Cheap Top 5. Yes. Know no, it's okay. Darn it. Okay, so a new mechanism that you're not sure about. Uh, I I actually like taking on that challenge as a first team, uh, as a resource during build during build season. I will I will take on a new mechanism that you're not sure about. But I would first of all make sure every other mechanism on your robot you have in your pocket and you have no doubt. Like I would use a kit chassis, or I would use your 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 tried and true chassis to start out with, so you don't have to do a lot of development on some other system. I wouldn't try to add a vision system that you don't know how to use. If you're gonna do something that's creative and ingenious on during the build season, just do that one thing as, as your creative thing. Do other things that you know how to do. Now, if you wanted to try something out like um, a new mechanism that's a manipulator or even like a new kind of drive system, and it's not during build season, I would make that a fall project and do a fall a fall project build for that. But again, back I think the question was more so if it's during build season. I think that's what they're 
ended. But um, I would also do your homework. Look look on online for YouTube videos. I would maybe ask on Chief Delphi if anybody has any advice. Um, if you do that, make sure you get your, your team's approval because you don't want to out your team with what your mechanism yeah. needs to be without their approval because some teams are pretty secretive about those things. Other teams are very wide open, and that's cool either way. Whatever team, whatever way you want to do that, um, do it, but don't do it without your approval of your team. So do your homework during the build season. Don't take other risks on your robot during the build season. But if you really want to develop something unique and novel, the best time to do it would be during the fall. Yeah. All right. So um, this one is for uh, wow. This these you guys have such great names that I can't pronounce. Uh, this is I'm going to call I'm going to Rob Orb. Rob Orb 2017 asks. Uh, he references a specific slide from your presentation. It was number 17. He says, "Do the the two motors and gearboxes in the red dots uh, in the arm design on slide 17?" have to be mechanically linked. No, no, no. Those, that's an either or. So do not put a motor in both of those locations. Oh, My okay. My intent there was to have either a motor on the top where the shoulder is or on the bottom where that, that link goes to push the push rod up. Okay. Hopefully no, more, more people didn't misunderstand that. <laughs> do not put... I, will, I don't recommend two motors driving your arm. Only have one, maybe maybe two motors into one gearbox. That would be fine. One one power station, one power source, either low or high, not both. Okay, cool. That that I think that's that that clarifies what we're asking about. Yeah. Um. So another question. This is from Nutty Man Fifty Four, and he did give me permission to tell you who he is on the internet here. That's Evan Morrison from Game Sense. If you're curious. Ah. So, um. So he's asking, um, what's your favorite FRC and effector that you've helped design and why? Favorite and effector that I helped design, I'm trying to think through. Mm -hmm. There's been uh, whatever it is. What, uh, I've had 21. 21? Oof, yikes. Yeah. Or, no, 98. No, more than that. 98 was my was my first year, but I skipped 2015, not on purpose. Yep. And my last year on Technocat, that was mostly just an advisor, 2011. So in the factor, I think, I think 2004, that, that, and I have the picture of the darn thing. It's, it's, it's right there. And, oh my gosh. Okay, I just messed it up. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Now we have infinite screens. No, you're good. <laughs> it's all right. Wonderful. 2004. Um, the roller claw from 2004, grabbing one ball and placing it in the, over a defender robot into a goal was very satisfying when that worked correctly. Yeah. And um, it was a very complex arm for that year. It was it was somewhat needed. We tried to use the same arm for the next year where it wasn't needed, and that was a big mistake. Yeah. You know, um, but, I, I find that that most of the, the robot parts that, that I've been a part of or, or worked with a bit on a team for, I, I tend to find if it's my favorite mostly by um, by how, it, how, how I feel when I see it work, you know? Like when, when everything works really, really well and I get super excited to see it do the thing. Like my 2013 robot when we climbed to the top of the pyramid – were we the best at it? Nope. Were we the fastest at it? Nope. But when it finally happened, it was just, it was so satisfying for me and my students that, uh, that it, 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 it made the whole year, you know? Yeah. So. One, of, one of the disappointments, and our, our kids didn't regret it too much. Actually, they said at the end of the year they didn't regret it. But in 2017, we had a, we had a pretty good shooter. We are a pretty good fuel shooter. But our total, our max for that shooting system that we ever got was 37, K, you know, 30, 37 points. And you needed 40 points to get oh. that ranking. So we got 35, we got 32, we got 37. And it was like, like you're in a poker hand and you have a pretty good hand. So you want to stay in. So me and Nick, we were sitting in the stands and we were like, 
and I remember vividly talking to the other engineers and the lead students and thinking, you know what, we got to give up on this thing. And then there they go, and they score 37 KPA. We're thinking, oh my gosh, we're so close to 40. We got to keep going. Yep. We never got it. It's so frustrating. Yeah. You know, I, I not to not to go old man on you two here, but we we had a we had a um, in 2012 on my team. We built a product. We wanted to build a, a robot that would shoot baskets from full range field, right? And wow. so we built a prototype, or like the, one of the people on our team, Paul Van Amelia, built a prototype in about you know an hour and a half or two that shot the ball like 35, like he shot it toward the goal from like 25 to 30 feet away, right? And we're like, oh my god, if we can do this in like an hour, we can definitely build one that shoots full field by the end of the season. <laughs> nope, that prototype was the was <laughs> the longest we ever got. <laughs> and, and Paul has gone on to really do really cool other things too. So he he's won some a, he's won some other robots. Yeah, he won, he's won yeah. he's done some other robot stuff before. You know, a couple world championships, a couple few BattleBot championships, a couple million dollars in so, prize money from NASA. So said that he's one of the only people that has won three separate world championships and robot competitions. Is that true? As far as I know, yeah. If you think about it, he's won the first world championship with his team on well, for two different teams on 190 and 254 he's right, yeah, won yeah. he won battle bots three times he also won a nasa centennial challenge for a million dollars so he knows how to build competitive robots that's 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 absolutely true of him um Very cool. so we have a couple other questions again if you've got more go ahead and send them in on the chat and i'd be happy we'd be happy to send them in but um andy would you mind if, if somebody asked a question about a little more about sort of like um uh uh, the any mark side of Andy. That's that's fine. I am whatever topic they want to ask. Take it on. Cool. All right. So there, there this is uh, Amito six two. Ask again. He, he's curious. How do you guys manufacture the sprockets, the ones with the hubs, your hub sprockets? How does that end up going down for what you guys do? CNC lathe. That's all lathe work. Right. Just so out of. Hang, hang on. Most of them are lathe work. There's some of them that we've done over the years in very high volume as an extrusion. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so you 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 extrude out the profile and then cut the hub into the one side of it, or it's just a big long stick of of uh, of a sprocket, just like we do hubs. We yep. do that for high volume hubs, and then we shove it into a CNC lathe, a four four feet lengths, and the lathe work makes the other features of the of the sprocket. Wow. Cool. And so for the the smaller ones, do they, do they? This is me getting nerding out a little bit too. Do you do you, do you do like live tooling to get the 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 actual sprocket profiled, or do you do cut blanks and then finish it on a mill? Live tooling. Okay. I'm, I'm ninety percent sure. Now, I'll admit all of that stuff is outsourced. Right. We have we have multiple sources. We do not do that work in house. We have some machining capabilities in house, but we don't have the, the sprockets made in house right now. I would like to get to that point, at least some, some of that work done in house within the next two or three years. But I'm not there yet. We're not there yet. Yep. All right. Cool. Uh, and this is again a little, a little bit off topic to a certain extent. But um, this question is from uh, JB987, and uh, they're asking. Um, this is like uh, he admits it's not a related question, but here he's asking: Is any mark working with the uh, the retooled? Uh, Chevy, uh, I believe it's a Chevy plant in Kokomo that's doing the work on ventilators, or or do you have any anything to t say about that? Yeah, hi Joe, how you doing? <laughs> What's up, Joe? Um, uh, no, we're not. I actually talked to I talked to a guy in their purchasing department with the General Motors plant in Kokomo. Kind of cool story there. I, I used to work in that plant. That was oh, wow. years ago when I hired in. It was it was GM Delft Electronics. Then it became Delphi. Then after the bankruptcy court all got settled, it went back to GM. So a lot of the equipment I used to design as an engineer are still being used within that GM um, plant before they started making uh, ventilators just recently. It was, there's not too many people working there, but there were still a few people working there before the ventilators got started. Wow. But no, um, they've hired, I don't know, I, I, I think, I should know this, but they've hired a lot of people on this temporary basis to make ventilators here in Kokomo. And there's been people actually moving in from other GM plants to help manage that. 
So they've hired a lot of Kokomo people on a temporary basis because they're not going to make ventilators forever here in Kokomo. I don't think so. But but we're working on supporting ventilator builds that aren't the Kokomo ventilator build for whatever reason. But we were fortunate to have two different groups design Andy Mark motors into their ventilator designs. One of them is the event group out of MIT. Um, and we've really enjoyed working with those folks and they've designed in a, a PG-188 with the half inch hex to be the main power source to squeeze the the oh, the ventilator airbag. Yep. I, I, there's a name for it, I don't know what it is. And then another group out of Israel that was um, led by three active FRC teams were using the the half inch hex output shaft on a snowblower motor. Huh. A lower torque, a little bit higher RPM, but using the same kind of motion to squeeze the bag, get um, airflow in a person if they're on a ventilator. And this was, and the control systems on, the, on those are not simple. They're highly specific control systems that vary depending on what feedback they get from the patient. Right, absolutely. I don't know a lot about that, but that's, I know it's more complex than just squeezing a bag and shoving air into somebody's. Lung. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I won't go into my opinions on all the crazy, goofy stuff I've seen on YouTube from people, but uh, that's a different story. Uh, we have a, we have another. We're, we're we're coming toward the end of the evening, so we're going to do the last couple questions here. Um, this one here is from Steph Morris, and she asks: From your twenty plus years of of robots in FRC, what have you observed about how robot design and performance has evolved? Any favorite or least favorite change, or maybe even just the biggest change that you've seen? Hmm. Well, I think gradually every year we've been adding power. Yep. So if you look back at, there's some pretty good videos. Um, if you go to, if you want to see old robot game videos, go to Andy Mark 45 on, no, Andy Baker 45 on YouTube. Find a bunch of old videos, um, like from 99 or 2000, 2001, 2002. I think I have. There's, there's a really good video from 2000 with Chief Delphi versus 131 and yeah. Wave, and I think 201 was in that too. You got Marjorie Jenkins driving and Tim Baird driving on a video. Yep. Anyway, my point is the robots are really impressive. This is an Einstein level robot back in 2000, but they're really slow. Yep. It's dramatically a lot slower than what you see now. Like the speed that we saw in Steamworks was pretty darn impressive. Full field movement back and forth, cycling, getting getting um, gears from the up, opposite side of the field and cycling back. They had, they had a lot of speed going on. Totally different. Totally different from 2000. I think the, the power on the robot has let teams do that. I think also, and it's hard for me to say this, um, but I think the Koch revolution over the years has been a huge impact. And I think it actually might have frustrated some of the top level teams because it let the median resource teams and even the low resource teams learn pretty quickly on how to compete against the top level, top resource teams. Yeah. It used to be back in the early 2000s, late 90s. The difference between the top level teams and the low level teams, the intro teams or the rookie teams, was vast. This, there was there was a huge amount of distance of, of capability between the high end teams and the low level teams. And what the COTS revolution has done over the years with Andy Mark, Vex, um, Rev, West Coast Products, even uh, you know across the road, cross road electronics, um, even even like e stop robotics. IR3, um, next gen robotics, all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of people got all sorts what of robotics. Done, what? All sorts of robotics. Everybody. What that has done is it, it made it more attainable for these entry level teams, rookie teams, or teams without a lot of resources to to quickly learn and get themselves up to competition level to compete with these high level teams. And I actually think when that started. Those high-level teams are like, oh, great! Now we have to, now we have to really work hard to beat everybody, not just 
those other fellow high level teams. Yeah. It's been a good thing. It's, it's really increased the amount of parity in robotics competitions. It lets everybody play at a high level. And that's been a good thing. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I've, I've seen over the years is the floor has come up significantly from what it used to be. You know, I, I remember when I was a freshman in high school, it was pretty common to see robots that their end goal for the competition was just being able to drive and move yeah. or even just being able to manipulate a single game piece. But I, I'm a little bit skewed because I'm in a district for sure. Right. But like at least in the districts I go to uh, and all the other matches I see, it's very rare to see robots that are struggle that much these days. By the way, if, if people watching, this is the match Andy was talking about. Uh, we're putting it up on the screen right now. So, Oh, cool. Yeah. So anyway, very cool. So we got, uh, I think we got like one uh, last question here. This is, um, we're going to take this question from Reaper Goat. And, and they're asking, um, what about when you were discussing your uh, conveyors and rollers? Um, what about conveyors with, with rollers on both sides? Where do they fit uh, within your preferences as to what you prefer for rollers? What about conveyors with, on yeah, because you, you showed like independent rollers and then a belt on one side and belt on two sides. I think I think the thing about the rollers, putting the rollers between the bears, is you can index your roller system by adding in motors at different locations. Whereas a conveyor, you really once you drive a conveyor, you're only you're limited by the mechanics of that one belt whereas with a roller system you can add you can add if you have four rollers you can have four different motors that means you can index whatever you're conveying independently depending on how many sensors you have and such and you can have a lot more control of the items that you're conveying if you have more rollers or more ro more motors controlling those rollers but you can you can you can drive a roller system much like a conveyor if you just have belts between your roller systems my, my point there was pointing out that rollers can be controlled differently because each roller can have its own independent motor. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. That makes sense. Is that Nick? Reaper Goat? No. That, um, uh, I, I, again, I, I don't like outing them on air, but I'll tell you afterwards who it is. Okay. You know them, though, for sure. Uh, let's actually, you might have, you might have seen them in the last, like, uh, eight to ten hours somewhere oh uh, yes okay yes, okay um uh, okay I know. <laughs> all right well with that said uh andy thank you so much for joining us today and, and giving your presentation about uh, about uh manipulators and appendages here it's a lot of fun it's great talking with you and uh you're going to be back on on saturday is that correct yeah i'm excited about that we have we have actually five championship woody flowers award winners um going to be on saturday what, what is it? Is it? Yep, it'll it, be Saturday, Saturday at three o'clock Eastern. Three o'clock Eastern. Three yep. o'clock Eastern. I think it's going to be myself, myself, Kyle Hughes, um, Freddie Lombardi, Alan. Oh, really, Al Alan Gregory? Yeah, I think. I think Alan Gregory, and then one other. This is off the record because I should know this. <laughs> it's okay. Well, you know what? Once you once you figure that out, send it to me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna publish it on the uh, the schedule we've got on Chief Delphi for anybody who wants to check that out. But you've got five of the five of the of the actual full Woody Flowers Award winners, and we'll, you guys are gonna be having a discussion about sort of the process about selecting those not winners, and I believe you're gonna talk about sort of why it's important and how students are choosing their nominees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're we're not gonna we're not gonna give you a rubric or the exact record of how to win this thing. That's not our intent here because there is right. We've we've actually we resisted that from day one when we started the the finalist award back in two thousand and four. But um, we're gonna give you tips on on how to do it. We're gonna give you, give you tips on why. We're, I think we're gonna talk mostly about why people should do this, why teams should do this. It's its own a nomination. I always say a nomination for a Woody Flowers Award is always its own award. Yes. And they it as such. Yeah, and and you know to say that I was uh, I was honored to be nominated by my team this year, um, and it was it was you know getting to read the essay and to sort of see what the students thought of me in a in a vulnerable moment sort of was a, a great experience. So 
Uh, anyway, cool. with all that mushy stuff out of the way, I got to remind everybody that tomorrow at 2 p.m., day four begins, and we're starting it off with a bang tomorrow. Karthik's going to be on, and he's going to do his strategic design presentation, the one that always fills up every single room at the championship that he goes to. That should be a lot of fun, so make sure to tune in, in, tune in 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, remember, your, your, if, unless your boss is standing over your shoulder, you can watch. You, it's not a big deal. Just watch it. It's fine. Um, and then we got more stuff coming up Friday and Saturday. We're looking forward to all of that. One more time, thank you so much for being here, Andy, and taking the time out of your day to be here. And thank you guys for watching. I hope to see many of you tomorrow. But until then, have a good evening. Thank you.